Okay, so I, I left you with um, sort of an incomplete, um, well, a smattering of stuff. So I want to fill in some holes and, and things like that. Um, let's see. Are, first of all, are there any questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, when you do the uh, expansion, like x times plus x mm -hmm. plus one, yep. you put the epsilon in the exponent of the x five term. Could I put it in the exponent? Yes. yes. That's a that's a really that's a wonderful question, and it's really really an interesting. It opens a whole area of possibilities. Um, did you all? Did everybody hear the question? We we were when we were on the first lecture, we took as an example um, that the problem of finding the roots of that equation. Okay, and we said we would like to do perturbation theory. So there were several possibilities that we considered. One possibility was to insert an epsilon over here. Okay. And what was nice about that possibility is that nothing abrupt happens as you reach the unperturbed problem. So there's no abrupt change that occurs. Um, so the kind of abrupt change that could occur would be that some roots might disappear. Okay? But clearly, as epsilon goes to 0, there are always five roots. Okay? And even at epsilon equals 0, there are still five roots. Okay? We only look, by the way, we only looked at the real root. But if we had started with the complex root, then we would have found um, a perturbation calculation of the complex root as well. So we could have calculated any of the five, um, any of the five roots of the polynomial. Okay? The second thing we looked at was putting an epsilon in front of this term. And that, was, that, that raised a really interesting question. And, and the question was, you know, you can do perturbation theory, but apparently you can only find one root because the unperturbed problem only has one root. That, of course, is not true. Um, and the reason is, do you remember that we showed that the roots, the other four roots, disappear as epsilon goes to 0 by going off to infinity. Okay. How did they go off to infinity? The other four roots, each of the roots, behave like some constant over epsilon to the 1 quarter okay, as epsilon goes to 0. Remember, we showed that. Okay. And this is some complex constant. Okay. So to attack the problem, um, so th this, this way was working. To, to continue with the problem here, which I didn't explain to you, but while I'm answering your question, I'll mention this too. Um, what we could do is to say, since we know that the other roots behave like some constant over epsilon to the 1 quarter as epsilon goes to 0, why don't we make a change of variable? Why don't we say let um, x equal, so you notice I'm switching from an asymptotic approximation back to an equality for the moment. And I say, why don't we let x equal y over epsilon to the 1 quarter? Because that's the natural thing to do. Now, if we substitute this into the equation, we get y to the 5 over epsilon to the 5 quarters plus y over epsilon to the 1 quarter equals what? Got it? And of course, we have put an epsilon over here. Okay. Now let's multiply through by epsilon to the 1 quarter. And you see that we have the problem that reads like this. Now, this is a very nice problem. Okay. Because now you see the way epsilon naturally wants to be inserted into the problem. It doesn't really want to be over here. Okay, It really wants to be over here. 
And now, when epsilon is equal to 0, this equation reads y to the 5 plus y is equal, is equal to 0. This is the unperturbed problem. Got it? And now, we can find all five roots of this equation. Okay, And you can see that, well, if, you know, if, if y is not equal to 0, we can divide out y. Okay, We see that there's, of course, one solution is y equals 0. But the other four solutions um, satisfy y to the 4 plus 1 is equal to 0. Okay, And we can expand about 0. That would be the first term in the series. It's a perfectly good first term in the perturbation series. Here are the other four roots. We can develop series, in general, of the form sum from n equals 0 to infinity, um, a sub n epsilon to the 1 quarter to the n. So epsilon to the 1 quarter is the natural small parameter for this problem. Okay, And of course, for this root, all that this means is that a0 is equal to 0. That's all. Okay. And for the other four roots, a0 is the complex solution of that algebraic equation. Okay. But you've asked a really interesting question. You've said, wait a minute, case 3, why don't we put it up? There's another place we could put it. Notice we've, we've now put it here, here, and when you put it here, it naturally goes over here. Okay. But another possibility is, say, to put it up in the exponent. This opens an absolutely fascinating um, possibility, because what you're suggesting is, why don't we consider something like, um, well, we can solve x plus x equals 1. We can solve that problem. Not very hard. Okay. So why don't we consider putting epsilon up here? Okay. Now, epsilon plays a very, and the answer to your question is, of course, we can do exactly as we did before. You notice the unperturbed, the unperturbed problem um, reads 2x uh, equals 1. Okay. So the solution is x equals 1 half. That's the first term in the series. And now we can look for a solution, x of epsilon, is a series of the form a sub n, epsilon to the n, same as before. Okay, exactly the same as before, sum from 0 to infinity, where a0 is now 1 half. And we can substitute this into the equation, expand in powers of epsilon. Of course, we're going to get logs of 2 all over the place, but who cares? So it's just a number. And it turns out this is a very, very powerful way of doing uh, perturbation theory. Okay? And the radius of convergence of this series will be 1. Now, of course, at the end of the problem, we want to set epsilon equal to 4. So again, we're going to be outside the radius of convergence. Okay? But we're going to learn what to do about that. That's, that's the objective for the next few days. Okay? Yeah? So just kind of pointing out here that we talk about the radius of convergence in the southern plane, right? In the epsilon plane. So that's right. So the radius of convergence is determined. So this is the complex epsilon plane. And there's a singularity at minus 1. Okay, and that's what that's the reason that the thing has a radius of convergence of one. Okay. Yesterday we saw two expansions in the tutorial. Mm -hmm. One as as an epsilon as a uh, Taylor series in epsilon, and another one is a Taylor series in x. Right. And we compared those two. That's right. That's right. And as a Taylor series in powers of epsilon, you this was this um, this. Uh, Different, the second order differential right. equation with an e to the minus x in it. That's right. As a series in powers of epsilon, the radius of convergence is infinite, just so long as x is finite. Okay. Also, as a series in powers of x, the radius of convergence is infinite Okay. in, in both of those cases. Okay. Um, so. But we don't, we're not worried about the fact that we might want to evaluate this series at epsilon equals 4. That's not a problem. 
because we're going to learn how to sum factors in series. That's, that's a meaningful thing to do. Um, but this general idea of putting an epsilon in the exponent is fantastic. So let me give you an example. Okay? Um, have any of you seen, uh, what's a good example? Have any of you seen the Thomas Fermi equation? Or have you heard about it? No? Okay, the Thomas Fermi equation is a semi classical approximation to the charge distribution uh, in an atom, in a nucleus of an atom. Okay? So the charge distribution is the charge in an atom is not, loca lo not located exactly at the center. Okay, it's not at a point. It's actually distributed. Okay, and the distribution is governed by an equation that reads y prime prime um, equals y to the three halves over the square root of x. This is this is called the Thomas Fermi. Um, equation. And there's a boundary condition. y of 0 uh, is 1 and y of infinity is equal to 0. And if you solve the equation on a computer numerically, you'll see that the solution looks like this. Here's what, this is x. Um, here's y. And the solution behaves like this. Okay, And as, as you expect, the charge distribution goes to the, x is the radius of the atom, okay? And the charge distribution is highest at the center, and then it gradually decays, okay? So this is a second order differential equation um, with the boundary condition at one at infinity. So this is a boundary value problem, and nobody knows how to solve that, okay? Looks simple enough, maybe. It's only two terms. But it's hopeless. Okay? And in fact, solving this numerically and getting this curve is also very difficult. So if you're interested, I, I, I don't want to give you instruction on numerical analysis here. But I can tell you how you go about solving that equation. It's very non-trivial okay? numerically. And that's because this equation is unstable. But suppose a guy walks up to you in the street and says, I've been working on the Thomas Fermi equation, and I haven't. I, I dropped my computer, and it doesn't work. But I'd really like to have a good approximate solution to this equation. Okay. So, what do you do? Okay, this is a very very hard problem, and it's nonlinear. Okay, y to the three halves here. So this is this is a very very difficult problem. What do you do? Aha! You do exactly what you suggested. Okay? You say, hmm, I can solve the following unperturbed problem with the same boundary conditions. I can solve y prime prime equals y. <coughs> okay? And with these boundary conditions, same, same boundary conditions, y of 0 equals 1, y of infinity is equal to 0. Um, what's the solution to this problem? This is a linear problem, of course. What's the solution here? To the minus six. Say it again. E, e to the power of minus x? No, e to the no, minus, minus x. That's right. That's right. That's right. So the solution, so let's call this y0. And the solution is y of x equals e to the minus x. OK? Very good. So can you read that? e to the minus x. So, so here. The unperturbed problem, um, y0, the, the unperturbed problem is solvable. And now let's use your trick. So let's consider the equation y um, prime prime equals y times y over x to the epsilon. OK? And let's look for a solution. y is the sum of y sub n times epsilon to the n where y0 is e to the minus x. And all we need is about one or two terms. Two terms in this series beyond y0 gives you a fantastically accurate approximation. So what is epsilon in this case really? What is this doing? This is measuring how nonlinear. Epsilon is a measure 
of the nonlinearity of the problem. Okay? That's the advantage of putting it up in the exponent, because epsilon has a meaning. Okay? As you turn on epsilon, the problem gradually moves away from the linear case, which is exactly solvable, to a nonlinear case. And you can use this in all sorts of possible contexts. For example, suppose you were solving, um, let's see, who knows what this equation says? Does anybody know this equation? It's a nonlinear wave equation. Say it again. Say it again. No, no, no. I think you, you, you had it. Yes. This is the Cordovec de Vries equation. Cordovec de Vries equation. Um, it's a beautiful nonlinear wave equation. If we had lots of time, we could talk about things like this. Fantastic equation. This, if I take this away, this take one derivative with respect to x away and put a minus sign here, then this becomes the Burkert's equation. Okay, again, a beautiful nonlinear wave equation that exhibits shocks and so on. And people, people use this equation here, the KDV equation, to study solitons and the scattering of solitons. So wonderful equation. If you don't know about the KDV equation, you'll have something wonderful in store. You'll see. You'll love it. Okay. okay. But this is a nonlinear PDE. And if you were looking for a way to solve this equation approximately, we could use your technique again. We could say, raise this, power, this u. We could raise this to the power epsilon. And when epsilon is equal to 0, this equation is what <coughs> this linear equation results. Right? And we can solve that by taking a Fourier transform. Okay? So this technique is very helpful. And if you're interested in particle physics or quantum field theory, and you've had some stuff, you might consider the Lagrangian grad phi squared plus, say, m squared phi squared plus d phi to the 4. Okay? And what might you do here? You, you would say, gee, if this term weren't here, we could solve this equation because this is a free uh, field theory. It's just a free theory. It's like a harmonic oscillator. And it's this stupid term here that makes things so difficult to solve. All right, you say, fine. We'll replace this by phi squared times phi squared to the epsilon. Okay, and we'll gradually turn on epsilon. And we'll expand in powers of epsilon. And when epsilon is equal to 0, you have this theory, free theory. And already, you can see that when epsilon is equal to 0, the mass in the theory has shifted. The mass term has shifted. So a renormalization is built into the theory. Already, you can see the renormalization, the mass shift in the theory. Okay, so this is fantastic. And the possibilities are endless. This is a very, very rich um, thing to study. This, you can mine this for years. You could spend your life playing with this idea. Yeah? Why does the quantum field theory textbooks uh, do that? I've never seen that in that way. Because they're boring? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Now, I mean, because, no, the, the, the answer is one word, tradition. Oh, I see. OK, it's just not traditionally what the way people go about. You know, this theory, if you put it in epsilon, you can develop a whole Feynman set of Feynman rules to study the theory. There's a whole expansion and so on. There are, if you look around, you'll see that there are papers on this idea. Okay? But it's buried. It's, it's, in part, it's called, it's used in solid state as, a, as something called the replica trick. And so people have looked at things related to this. But so this is a very, very rich idea, a very interesting idea. OK, let's see. Um, hmm. OK, so let's see, any other questions? Anyway, that's a 
fascinating thing, and maybe we'll talk about that. Okay, maybe, maybe we'll, if you like, if we have some time, maybe we'll spend the lecture talking about that, because this is something that interests me a lot. And it's a very, very rich and interesting thing to do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> no, I can't resist. I will say one thing. Um, so you might say, um, you might say, <clears throat> you might say, why did I say phi squared to the epsilon? Do you know why I did that? Because phi is a field, and it could be positive or negative. Okay? And if, we, if phi were negative, we would be raising a negative number to a, to a power epsilon, which becomes complex. A negative number to a fractional power becomes complex. Okay, So it might be complicated. And you might think that you'd have to put in a phi squared there. But um, some of my current research is recognizing that that's not true. In fact, it's better to make it complex. And so you might say, in quantum mechanics, let's consider the Hamiltonian h is equal to p squared plus x squared, just in quantum mechanics. What's that Hamiltonian? I mean, what does this represent physically? Harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator. OK. Now, what happens if we multiply that by ix to the power epsilon? OK. So now, this is explicitly complex. And as I turn on epsilon, the Hamiltonian is no longer Hermitian. And it turns out that it doesn't matter that it's not Hermitian. And if you look at the eigenvalues, so here's epsilon, and here are the eigenvalues. When epsilon is equal to 0, the eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian are, this is, the, this is usually twice the harmonic oscillator. So the eigenvalues are 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. Okay, they're odd integers. Okay. And as epsilon increases, what happens is the eigenvalues remain real and positive. And they remain real, positive, and discrete for all positive values of epsilon, which is really strange because when epsilon is equal to 2, for example, here are the eigenvalues. Okay. What, you say? Hold on a minute. You're talking about an upside down potential. Because for epsilon is equal to 2, the Hamiltonian is p squared minus x to the 4. How could it be that a potential that looks like this has bound states whose energies are up here? And the answer is it does. And I'm not going to explain to you why that's true. <laughs> but if you want to know, we can chat after class. OK, any other questions? <laughs> I love crabbing on that. OK. Um, all right, so let's see, back, back to work. Um, we were talking about how to solve eigenvalue problems. and. The eigenvalue problem that I used for illustration, the simple eigenvalue problem, was the Hamiltonian h is a b plus epsilon times c c, okay, which is which is the Hamiltonian a epsilon c epsilon c b, okay, and what I showed you was that the eigenvalues could be thought of as branches, that's a technical term, okay, as branches of a single function, e of epsilon, which we can call an energy function, which had the form, I don't know if I can remember it exactly, but it was something like, what was it, a plus b um, plus the square root of something like a minus b 
squared plus 4c squared, was it um, epsilon squared? Something like that. Is that what, what it came out to be? Something like that. Plus or minus and plus. Yeah, now we don't have to write plus or minus, okay? Because this is a square root function, okay? Now, you've had, if I understand correctly, you've had a, just a brief introduction to complex variables, okay? And the first thing I want to do, a little hole that I want to fill in here, is to make sure that you all understand enough complex variables to understand why I don't need to write a plus or minus sign here. Okay? So in general, in complex variables, when you, when you teach a course in complex variables, what do you do first? First, you explain what the complex number system is. Okay? So we generalize from real variables to complex variables. Instead of the real number line, you generalize that to the complex numbers, okay? which have the form you know, x plus i, y. So the complex number z can be represented as points in a plane instead of x, which are points on a line. Okay, so that's fine. So you, you introduce the complex numbers. And the second thing you do is you introduce complex functions. Okay, so what's an example of a complex function? f of z equals z, okay, or z squared, or <coughs> something like that, or then you can talk about rational functions, you know, z plus 1 over <coughs> z cubed plus 14. Okay? So these are elementary complex functions. And then the next step in, in making up complex functions, it occurs to you, <coughs> well, we have a function called square root of x, okay, which you learned in high school. And what you learned in high school is that there's a button on your pocket calculator that has a picture that looks like this. And if you push the button, it produces a number. And, okay. So the question is, can we define a function square root of z? Okay. It turns out this is the first non-trivial aspect of complex <coughs> variables, a really, really non-trivial aspect of complex variables um, that doesn't have an analog in real variables. In fact, what you learn is that this function square root of x in real variables that you learn is nonsense. Okay? It's impossible, really, to explain what the square root of x is properly. So this is where complex variables becomes essential. So why is it that this is such an interesting function? So <clears throat> what you do is what you learn is this. One way to represent a complex number z is in polar coordinates. This is the orthogonal representation. You know, the, this is the x plus i, y, the usual simple representation. But there's a polar representation, which can be written as r e to the i theta. Okay? So in complex variables, here's the complex z plane. Here's x, here's y. Here is a point in the complex z plane x plus i y. Okay? And you can imagine that its coordinates, you know, are x y. But a polar representation of this same complex number consists of writing down r, which is the distance from the origin to that point, and theta, which is the angle, okay, from from the uh, real axis up to the radial line, okay? Okay, and what's the advantage of a polar representation? Well, if you have two complex numbers, z1 is r1 e to the i theta 1, and z2 is r2 e to the i theta 2, then z1, z2 is r1, r2 times e to the i theta 1 plus theta 2. And you learned that, right? Everybody, I assume you're all comfortable with that, right? Okay, great. So if you multiply two complex numbers, you multiply the modulus, but you add the angle. Okay? So you add the r, this theta is called r z, and you add the angle, the polar angle. Okay? And that's, that's very nice. So why is it so nice? Because this provides a natural way 
to define the function square root of z. And you might say, how in the world are we going to define this function square root of z? So you say, ah, it's obvious. When I push the button on my calculator, you know, if I put 3 into my calculator and I push the square root button, out pops you know, 1.732, so on like that. right? And how do I know it's the right answer? Because if I take 1.732, and so on, and square it, I get back 3. Okay, So I have to think of, if I'm going to define this function square root of z, I have to think of a way of writing down something here such that when I square it, I get back z. Okay? So it takes you two seconds, and you say, ah, look. If z is written in polar form, e to the i theta, then I will define square root of z to be the square root of the modulus. And that's OK, right? because r is a real positive number. And to find this, all I do is push the button on my pocket calculator, and out pops you know, 1.732. Okay? e to the i theta over 2. And how do I know this must be the right definition? This is the definition of the function f of z, of the function f of z equals the square root of z. How do I know that's the correct definition? Because if I square this, I get back z. If you don't believe it, watch. The square of the square root of r times e to the i theta over 2, following this rule, Right, Dewab's theorem and all that kind of thing, is r times e to the i theta. So this must be the right answer. But this is fraught with difficulty. What's the problem? I don't know. OK, what's the, what's the problem? You're, you haven't defined the theta carefully. Right. That's right. You've said it very tersely. That's exactly right. I have to be very careful in defining theta. Okay, you're right. Okay, so so let's let me illustrate what goes wrong. Okay, so what goes wrong <clears throat> is suppose we say this is theta is equal to zero. Okay, and suppose we take just for fun. Suppose I take r equals one. Okay, so I take the number. This is z equals one. And by this definition over here, <clears throat> if this is theta is equal to 0, I conclude that the square root of z equals 1 is 1, right? Because the definition is that I divide 0 by 2, so I still have 0, right? And I take the square root of 1 using my pocket calculator, and I get 1, right? And I conclude that. The square root of 1 is 1. Now I smoothly, very, very smoothly, rotate around like this, increasing theta. Okay. So for example, when I get all the way around to minus 1, I have increased the angle all of theta is now pi. And I conclude that the square root of minus 1 is e to the i pi over 2. You all see that? So I conclude that the square root of minus 1 is i. Okay? And I keep going, gradually increasing theta, until I come back to this point. Now, the angle, because I've been increasing theta all along, when I come back to this point, theta is now 2 pi. It's not 0 anymore. And therefore, I conclude that the square root of 1 is equal to e to the i pi, which is minus 1. Wait a minute. I'm defining a function. A function is something that has a unique answer, Okay, and I'm not getting a unique answer. Okay, I can't have, can't have two answers. If it's multiple valued, it's not a function. Okay? So I begin by saying the square root of 1 is 1. And I go all the way around smoothly and come back to the same point 
and I conclude that the square root of 1 is minus 1. Contradiction. So it looks like I've died. Okay. So what do I do? I do something amazing. I say, and it's political, by the way. This is entirely political. <laughs> I say, <clears throat> at some point over here, I am no longer, I draw a line, starting at the origin, going off to infinity. And I say, when I cross this line, I am no longer on this sheet, the original um, uh, complex plane. I'm on a new complex plane. Okay. So I imagine that I have two complex planes. Here is <clears throat> here's the first complex plane, which I call the first sheet of a Riemann surface, and here's the second complex plane. Okay. And when I cross this line, if I start over here at theta is equal to zero, and when I cross that line. I am officially no longer on this complex plane, but rather I come out over here. I'm on sheet number two. Okay? And I go all the way over to here. And I'm perfectly happy because I'm on a different uh, complex plane. I'm not on the original complex plane, I'm on a different complex plane. I'm perfectly happy to say that on this complex plane, the square root of 1 is minus 1. And this explains why it is that you learned in high school that there are two possible answers when you, when you take the square root. Okay? It's really because the square root function is a complex function, and it must be. It is required to be defined on a Riemann surface having two sheets. If I keep going, and I go around again, and I cross that line, I don't come out here, rather I come out over here. And when I come back to this point, once again the square root of 1 is 1. Okay? So on this complex plane, the square root of 1 is 1. And on this complex plane, the square root of 1 is minus 1. And the, squ and the square root function is not defined on a complex plane, but rather it is defined on a pair of complex planes. It must be. Otherwise, it's not a function. In fact, not only is the square root function now single-valued, so there's a unique answer for every value of z, but it is continuous. It's a continuous function. And why do we want it to be a continuous function? Because ultimately, we have to take a derivative. We, we want the functions that we're defining to be differentiable. And if they're not continuous, they certainly can't be differentiable. The thing that students find it very hard to understand is, why did you put the cut over here? This is called the cut. Why did you put it over there? The answer is you don't have to. That's a political choice. Okay. So if you look at a map, for imagine an alien is approaching the Earth. Okay. And he looks down on the Earth, and he sees the ocean, and he sees the land. But then an Earthling shows him a map. Okay. There's a line like this, and here's the US over here, and here's Canada over here. I forgot to tell you, this alien walks on his head. Okay, His head is upside down. So, <laughs> so he sees Canada over here, and he sees the US over here. Okay. All right? So, but when the alien looks down at the Earth, the alien doesn't see a line over there. This is just a political designation. This is where the US ends and Canada begins. Okay. So we, as political people, we can put this line anywhere we want. And it doesn't have to be a straight line. It can be a wiggly line. Okay. Of course, usually for convenience, we make it a straight line, just for simplicity. So usually, <clears throat> we might say, there's a break. Stop that. There's a branch cut over here and a branch cut over here. Okay? But it has to be the same line. So if you cross this line going that way, you come out over here. If you cross this line going that way, you come out over here. Okay? Now, are there any questions about that? 
Okay, so now the function that we came up with is a particularly interesting function because um, this, this function that we came up with here, this is a particularly interesting function because it's not the square root of epsilon, but rather this square root has the form the square root of epsilon minus a times the square root of, you know, times say capital A and epsilon minus capital B. It's the product of two square root functions. Okay? Not just one square root function. So there are two branch cuts. So in the complex epsilon plane, <clears throat> there is a branch point here and here, and a branch point here and here. Okay? So the, these, these branch points, branch points, branch points are located at uh, epsilon is equal to plus or minus i times whatever, a minus b over 2c. Okay? These are the locations of the branch points, and the branch cuts have to be drawn in the same places, so that's a product of two independent square root functions. Okay? And when you cross this line, you come out over here. If you should cross this line, you come out over here. Okay? And you know what a Mobius strip is? You all know what a Mobius strip is. You take a strip of paper and you give it a twist and glue the ends to each other. And when you go around once, you come out on the other sheet. If you go around again, come back on the first sheet. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know, I mean, I can give you an illustration. Okay, see, this is a cup of, I better not spill this. This is a cup of tea, right? <clears throat> I go around once, and it's not the same. My arm is twisted, and it hurts. Okay, <laughs> and now I continue going in the same direction around again, and now I'm back to the beginning. Okay, so this is a so I'm a Mobius strip. In case you didn't know that, <laughs> it's a two-sheeted surface, and if you go around once, you do not come back. So I'm going around in this direction, rotating this way. I do not come back to the same physical configuration. But if I go around again in the same direction, I do. Now I'm back again. Okay? And you can't say where it was that I left that I left the first sheet and entered the second sheet. That's a political designation. Okay? This sort of stuff represents the dangers of drinking and deriving. You understand that? <laughs> Okay, so, so a simple way to draw the branch cuts, a very nice and elegant, simple way, is instead of having these lines go all the way off to infinity, one clever thing you can do with square roots, and only with square roots, I warn you, not with cube roots or logarithms or something, is that you can just connect these two points. And if you cross this line, instead of coming out here, you come out here. Okay? And what did we learn? There are two sheets in the square root function. One sheet corresponds to, in effect, putting a plus here, and the other sheet corresponds to putting a minus. But that's not true, because plus and minus doesn't mean anything here. It doesn't mean anything, because it depends on how you define the square root in the first place. Okay? <clears throat> um, and so we have two sheets, and the function e of epsilon, e of epsilon, is defined on a two-sheeted Riemann surface. So what do we mean by the first eigenvalue? The first eigenvalue, so eigenvalue number one 
comes from evaluating the function e of epsilon on the real axis, because we want the energies to be real. Okay? And we want the parameter epsilon to be a physical parameter. We want it to be real. So on the real axis on the first sheet. And what do we mean by E2? We get E2 if we evaluate this function on the real axis on the second sheet. In fact, if we evaluate it, this is, remember, this is the epsilon. These are, this is the epsilon Riemann surface. At epsilon equals 0, what we get is E1. At, right at epsilon equals 0, we learn that E1 equals A. And right at epsilon equals 0, we learn that E2 is equal to um, B. So how, where do we get quantization? Quantization really means that we're evaluating a single function called an energy function on a set of sheets that constitute a Riemann surface. That's why we think the world is quantized. So if you imagine a parking garage, which is perfectly smooth, if you take a saw and cut, slice right through the parking garage, right along the real axis, if you, look at, if you walk into a parking garage, you'll see a yellow stripe that represents the real axis. And if you slice through the parking garage, what you'll see is a bunch of levels, discrete levels. And because we're very narrow-minded, and we only think in terms of real variables, we think that quantum mechanics has quantized energy levels. Okay? But in fact, if you extend this to the complex plane, the energy levels are not discrete and not quantized. There's only one energy function. And it smoothly goes from one energy level to the other. Okay? If you drive around the parking garage and come back again to that yellow line on the second left floor, that's the second energy level. If you drive around again, that's the third energy. That's why we think quantum mechanics is quantized. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. But doesn't depend this nice and illuminating interpretation uh, on your choice of epsilon where you put it. And so, um, what where I, I put the branch the epsilon. Type, you mean? No, no, no. The epsilon in, into your uh, equation. Oh, sure. To, yes. Of course. So, of course. So I get a different, that's right. So if I put epsilon into my uh, Hamiltonian in a different place, then I'm going to get a completely different Riemann surface. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. So That's absolutely right. But when epsilon, and so why do I get a Riemann surface? It's because my Hamiltonian is not, no longer Hermitian when epsilon is not real. OK, it's only Hermitian if epsilon is real. Okay. So if I stick with real epsilon, I have well-defined real eigenvalues. And now what I'm doing is generating some sort of Riemann surface that connects all of those real eigenvalues. Okay. And we might argue that for the cases when epsilon is complex, um, the Hamiltonian is no longer physical. It's no longer a physical object. Okay. So what we have done is we have extended the real axis where there are physical eigenvalues okay, into the complex plane. And we've seen that these eigenvalues smoothly deform into one another. Okay. However, let me tell you something interesting. There is some work that is being done. Um, in fact, there's a paper that was just put on the web uh, just a few weeks ago um, where <clears throat> they can actually in the laboratory, move around in the complex plane. And they do this by looking at the modes of a uh, microwave uh, resonator. So you, take a, you make a, a microwave cavity. Okay? And you can change. You can, so the, the, this is a, a number of people. There are about five or six authors on the paper. It's absolutely beautiful work. Um, and so I guess the principal, the senior author on the paper is, is Richter. But the, in fact, he didn't do most of the work. The younger people did them. 
the hard work. This is very hard to do this, but you can make a microwave cavity, and you can put microwaves into the cavity using an antenna. Okay, And then you can vary the parameters of the cavity. And the parameters of the cavity are these epsilon, you know, epsilons. And then they actually have more than one epsilon. And they can move, and they look at the modes. And there are, of course, thousands and thousands of modes. And as you vary the parameters, you can measure the energy levels, the eigenvalues, the modes of, of the microwaves in this cavity. And you can actually see them go around in the complex plane and see one energy level analytically continue to another energy level. Absolutely beautiful work. It's just come out. It's fantastic. I mean, you can actually do this in the laboratory. So, so yeah. what do you mean when you say that one energy level analytically moves to another? Do they, In do the they, sense how do that, they measure so energy? over here, if we start at a value of, let's take epsilon equals 1, OK? Say epsilon is 1. Remember, this is the complex epsilon plane. And the epsilon, the energy function is explicitly written down over here, OK? So that gives you the energy for that real value of epsilon. Okay? Now, <clears throat> imagine that you have the ability, because you have some microwave cavity and you can adjust the parameters of the cavity. You know, you can stick, stick uh, junk into the cavity, you know, put a little magnet in the cavity, and put absorbers and reflectors and all kinds of things. Okay. <clears throat> so you can vary the parameter. And as you vary, in this case, there's just one parameter, epsilon, but there could be lots of them. And the eigenvalue moves. Okay? Now, I vary the parameter. If I, were to, if I were to vary this parameter and go around like this, keep varying the parameter and come back here, what would happen? I'd come back to exactly the same eigenvalue. Okay, but, but if I vary the parameter like this and I cross this branch cut, then I come out over here. And if I then return back to the original, exactly the original Hamiltonian, the parameter is, has the same value that I started out with, 1, say. Now, I have a different eigenvalue. So yeah. one eigenvalue smoothly and analytically continues to a different eigenvalue. OK, but is the, uh, is the, eigen, the energy eigenvalue actually complex during this? Yes, of and, course. And how do they measure a complex energy? Ah, it turns out that you can infer what is going on by looking at interference patterns. and It's, it's very interesting. I'll, I'll let you, you can read the paper. Yeah, sure, sure. OK, it's just, just a few weeks old. OK. Super. So it's, it's fantastic. Yeah? Uh, if the branch cut is arbitrary, <coughs> what defines physically the choice of branch cut? Because we, if it, if we, we as political it. animals, define it. In other words, where do we put the border between the United States and Canada? Okay. Yeah, I mean, but Frankly, what I would do if I had to draw the border, I would draw it like this. Okay, so the United States, you know, comes down here, and here's Texas and California, something like this, and Canada is up up here. What I would do <clears throat> is draw the border something like this. Um, I would say. <laughs> Okay, I, I would call this one country, and I, I would call this stuff the other country, because they don't vote the right way. <laughs> but we are political animals, and we define the borders wherever we want. If you look down from an airplane, you can't see a natural border. There isn't any natural border. We choose when you're on the first sheet and when you're on the second sheet. Yeah. So I just had a comment. Is that if you deform the <laughs> branch cut in such a way mm -hmm. that the first half actually intersected that branch cut, would intersect it twice. And if you deform, you mean if you move this branch cut around? No, on the, on the right hand side, you know, the, the big this. curve where you don't actually come back to the, you come back to the first eigenvalue. You know, this one here. Yeah. Yeah. But if you deform the branch cut such that, that Half now intersects with that branch cut, but it will always be intersecting twice. Exactly. And therefore, we'll always come back to the first eigen. That's right. This path always will come back to this point. 
even so if I drew the branch cut a different way, say like this, I've crossed it twice. So it would look like this. Here I've left the first sheet and I've come out on the second sheet and then I've gone down here, come back on the first sheet and then come back to the original point. Okay? Yeah, but to connect the points was our choice, right? To connect, the, to connect the two roots was our choice. So what was I? I'm sorry. I didn't, our choice. It was our. What was our choice? To connect the two roots. Well, no, that's right. Point. We we have a right to do that. We could either connect it or not. Yes. Yeah, so we can think of this branch cut here <clears throat> as going all the way up to infinity, and then going around at infinity to this one and coming back again. And then we can push that branch cut back into the finite plane continuously deforming the branch cut until it looks just like this. So all of those are perfectly acceptable choices. It's just our designation. You are now officially in the United States. You are now officially in Canada because you've crossed a branch cut. And we can put Canada and the United States anywhere we want. So in one of the tutorials, we did the uh, uh, point at infinity, how it can be mapped onto a on the Riemann sphere, so right. that basically is information. Yeah, that's right. And that's a, a fancy way of it. Very fancy geometrical <laughs> way of doing it. Okay. <clears throat> the main thing to remember is that when you do perturbation theory, the perturbation series does not typically have an infinite radius of convergence. Typically, a perturbation series has a non-infinite radius of convergence. When you did this tutorial yesterday, you did perturbation theory for an equation of the form y prime prime, now remind me, e to the minus, minus, x. minus x times y. You studied a problem like this, and you put an epsilon over here. And in, this is one of these rare cases where the perturbation expansion has an infinite radius of convergence if x is finite. Okay, but that's almost never happens. If there's a finite, a non-infinite radius of convergence, what determines the radius of convergence? Typically, it's a square root branch point. Okay? Where one solution deforms into another solution. Typically, that's what happens. Okay? And in fact, the most common thing to happen is that the radius convergence is zero. Okay? And that's what happens in quantum mechanics. Okay? And because the radius of convergence is zero, it means you end up typically with a divergent series. Okay? But what I want to do now is I want to show you how to sum a series. Okay, now this sounds stupid, right? Because you learned that back in elementary school. Um, so let's see. Can I... hmm. Okay, so this is really, this sounds, <clears throat> I, I know this must sound stupid to you, but what we have to talk about now is. Whoops. What's that? All right. Well, what we have to talk about now is when somebody gives you a series like this, how do you sum the series? Okay. Now, if you ask a guy, if you just walk down the street here in Waterloo, just stop a random person, and you say, I have a series of this form, okay, how do I find the sum of the series? The guy will say to you, you must be an idiot. This sum is a sigma, the letter S. Okay, S means sum. Okay, so you're supposed to add up the numbers, right? So you're supposed to do you're supposed to write down a zero, and then you add on a one, and then you add on a two, and you keep going. And if the series converges, the sum, the partial sum. Of, so if you sum this all the way up to a n. We call this the partial sum, Sn, of the series. Okay? And the guy in the street will say to you, it's obvious what you do. If the series converges, that means that the limit as n goes to infinity of S sub n is equal to the sum of the series, S. Period. 
What else? Okay? And you say to the guy, well, I have a problem. Okay? My problem is that the series I'm adding up is 1 minus a half plus a third minus a fourth plus a fifth, and so on. I have that series. Okay? Now, first question is, does this series converge? You say yes. Why does it converge? Um, there is this lattice criterion that says that every monotonously decaying uh, zero sequence with alternating signs gives a convergence of Bravo. Bravo. It's basically the alternating series test. If the terms in the series are monotone decreasing and they're alternating in sign, the series converges. You're absolutely right. Great. Oh, this is fun. All right. Did everybody understand that? It's the alternating series test. The series converges. All right, so here's the second question. What does it converge to? Oh. Does anybody know? Yeah. Logarithm of two. Very good. Okay. This converges to log of two, which is point six nine three. Oh, great. So it converges to log of two. All right. Suppose you listened to this guy on the street, and you started to add up these numbers. How close would you get to the square root of 2? The size of the term after you stop. It's hopeless. <laughs> In fact, if you allowed a supercomputer to run all night long adding up this series, you'd never get to the square root of 2. You could never calculate it to more than four or five decimal places. It's just ridiculous. So, in fact, the lesson to be learned is one of the dumbest things you can do is what the guy on the street told you to do. It's amazing to me. Very few people know what I'm about to tell you. But what I'm about to tell you is so simple. Okay? So the first thing I'm going to tell you is what Mr. Shanks told us. Okay. So Mr. Shanks says, look at the partial sums of this series. How will they behave? So if you make a plot, if you make a plot of, um, of s sub n as a function of n, what will we see? What will we see? Okay, so here's n equals 1, 2, 3. What will we see? We know that the series is going to converge to the log of 2, which is whatever, 0 0.693, something like that, right? Um, what will we actually see? Well, the first partial sum is just 1, right? So it'll be up here. And the second partial sum is 1 minus a half, so it's 0.5. So it's below 0 0.693. And then the next partial sum is above, and the next partial sum is below, above, <coughs> below, above, below. So it's oscillating about the answer. So Mr. Shanks says, Let's make a model of this series. Okay? So um, as a model, he says, suppose the partial sums have the form of the sum of the series. And maybe we'll get confused with that letter. Why don't we use the letter L for the limit of, of S sub n? Okay, so that's the sum of the series. This is the thing that it's, this is the limit here, this limiting value, we'll call this L. Okay? okay, you following me? So it's approaching some limit, but you notice that it's oscillating about the limit. And as a model, as a simple asymptotic model of this limit, we'll say that it has the form A times B to the N. And we'll think of B as a negative number, so that it's oscillating about this limit. So we'll think of b is, uh, is negative and less than 1. So as n gets bigger and bigger, the oscillations get smaller and smaller. Now, this is not exactly correct, is it? 
I mean, this, these, these, this, this partial sum does not have this form, but that's a very simple model of an oscillating series that's tending to a limit. Okay? So accept this for the moment. So then Mr. Shanks says, S stands for Shanks. Okay? So Mr. Shanks says, in this case, we don't care about A or B. We only care about the limit. Got it? So let's do the following. Let's write down Sn is L plus A B to the N. And Sn minus 1 would be L plus A B to the N minus 1. And Sn plus 1 is L plus A B to the N plus 1. You agree to that, right? And then he does something that you should never do when you're teaching in a classroom. Do not do the following. Don't do that. Terrible thing to do. OK. Next, let's write down the ratio of the middle term, divide, the, the middle equation, divided by the top equation. OK? So Sn minus L divided by Sn minus L divided by Sn minus 1 uh, minus L. If you divide these two, what do you get? B, right? That's just B. And what do you get if you divide the bottom equation by the middle equation? You get Sn plus 1 um, minus L divided by Sn minus L. You agree? OK, very simple. OK, great. So now, if you just forget B here, then we now have an equation for L, which is what we're looking for. Okay, L stands for me, means looking for. Okay, so all we need to do is to cross multiply. That will give us, of course, a quadratic equation for L. So there might be two roots, unless we're lucky, which is what L really stands for. Okay, <laughs> multiply through, you get S n squared minus two L S n plus L squared is equal to S n plus one S n minus one plus L squared. Um, minus L times Sn plus 1 plus Sn minus 1. Do you agree? And look what happened. L canceled out. It was fake. It looked like it was going to be a quadratic equation, but it isn't. It's just a linear equation for L. And the solution is Sn squared minus S n plus 1, s n minus 1, divided by um, 2 s n minus s n plus 1 minus s n minus 1 is L. Got it? You see what we did? So we have just calculated the limit. Now, of course, this can't be exactly right. Why is that? Because this is just a model of an oscillating sequence. So this, this, this here is a model of an oscillating sequence. OK, it's just a model. But it says if the sequence behaves like this, then the limit of the sequence is given by this formula depending on the nth term. So now, Mr. Shanks makes a brilliant jump. He says, suppose we have a sequence of partial sums, Sn. OK? That is, you know, S1, S2, S3, and so on. And they're tending to the limit L. He makes a model. And then he says, let's take a Shanks transform of the sequence. So the Shanks transform of this sequence is a new sequence. We'll call it S1. 
n, which is defined as exactly what I wrote down before, sn squared minus sn plus 1 minus sn minus 1, divided by 2sn minus sn plus 1. Um, oops, this is times minus sn minus 1. Okay, this times that. Okay? So this is definition of the new sequence. Okay? So this gives us S11, S12, S13, and so on. Uh, but not really S11. Why is that? Because to calculate S11, we would need S0, 1, and 2. But I said we only have S1 here. So this sequence begins. Um, Oops, we, we wrote it here. So, S1, 2, S1, 3. Okay? Now we do it again. When we make a new sequence, blah, 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 blah. Here's the second Shank sequence S3, S4, S5. Okay, so here's the second Shank's sequence, and then we can make a third. Shank sequence, and we can continue doing this. Let's look at those Shank's sequences. Let's see how they come out. Okay, so can is it? Can you lower the uh, screen? screen? Is there a way to? Yeah. Oh, good. It's opening up. Okay, that's great. <clears throat> It's warming. Okay. Do you push some buttons here to make the... Uh, she's going to do it from the control. Ah, good. Okay, super. Okay. There. See, that's how you spell shank. That doesn't have much information on it. But let's... Um, okay, so now here is the sequence that we're looking at. Okay? Now, if you talk to the average guy in the street, the guy says, by the way, this is the sum of the sequence. This is 0.693. This is the log of 2. 0.693, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Now, if you listen to the guy on the street, what the guy says is add up the numbers. So these are the partial sums. A. Those are the partial sums. So they go one, a half, blah, 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 blah. So after eight numbers, we're supposed to get 0.693, but after eight numbers, it's 0.634. And after, say, a million numbers, it's accurate to about three, maybe four decimal places. Three, three decimal places. Right. It's never getting there. On the other hand, if you take a shanks and you look at the sequence of shankses, by the time you've gotten just to the third number, 
The information is already there, and it already knows it's 0 0.690, 0 0.694, 0 0.692. Here it is, 0 0.693, 693. So by, by the time you use just seven terms in the series, you have already gotten it correct to one part in a thousand. On the other hand, if you take a second chance, it goes 0.693277. Look at that. And if you calculate the third chance, we have already got 0.6931467 instead of 6931472. Now, to calculate this shanks, you need to know these three shankses. And to know these three, you need to know all of these five. And to calculate these five, you need to know seven. So from just the first seven terms in the sequence, I know the answer accurate to an error of just one part here, one part in, well, in a million, from just the first seven terms. Okay, So the information is in the series, and we just have to coax the information out of the series. Of course, you can be inefficient and add up the series, but we want to get there fast. Okay. And what Mr. Shanks tells us is that by making an asymptotic model, we can extract the information. A really interesting problem is, is this the best way to do it? Of course not. Okay. <laughs> there are an infinite number of ways that you might be able to extract the information from the series. The question is, how do you determine the absolute optimal way? And that's a very deep problem in uh, information theory and statistical mechanics or statistical physics, and the answer is not no. If you find this interesting, you might want to look at it. Okay, But my point is that one way of getting the information out of a series is to sum it up, but it couldn't be dumber. Okay. Now let me show you something else. Here is an even more difficult series. Here is the series 1 over the square root of 2 plus 1 over the square root of 3 plus square root of 4 and so on. Okay. This is a very, very slowly converging series. You could never sum this series by adding up the numbers. It's absolutely impossible. You can't do it. Just completely impossible. Even if you have a hugely parallel computer that's working night and day for weeks and weeks. You can never do it. However, if you calculate the shanks transform of these partial sums, here's the first shanks, here's the second shanks, here's the third shanks, and we already know that the answer is, just from this first seven terms in the series, we know that the answer from this shanks is 0 0.60490 instead of 60489. In fact, 604898, and here we have 604900. So it's accurate to about one part in a million. So the information is there, and we just want to get the information out quickly. Okay? This is one possible way of doing it. Okay, you have a question. Well, uh, so how. Does this actually work for all alternating series, or can we test in some way of no, which series? No, because is you could make a new alternating series. You could be a very nasty person. Okay, <laughs> I know you're not a nasty person, but you could be a nasty person because you could define a new a new series, right, where the thirteen hundredth number in the series is pi. Okay, and obviously the first 1,200 coefficients in the series don't know about pi. They don't know that pi is coming up. So the problem with rigorous mathematics is that this is not a uniform thing. This, this can't work. This can't be correct in complete generality, because you can always make a counterexample. But you see, we're not mathematicians, <laughs> except for him. But we're not mathematicians, we're physicists, and we and physics is not 
physics problems are not nasty. They're not out to get us. You know, they're not out to fool us. They're very hard problems, and we don't know how to solve them analytically. Okay? We're trying to solve hard problems. And, and in physics, it rarely happens that the tenth term does something strange. That typically doesn't happen. So typically, the series have a kind of uniformity to them. And something strange doesn't happen at 15th order in perturbation theory that screws up these attempts at getting the answer from the first seven coefficients. Okay, So this series has a kind of uniformity. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of smoothness to, these, to this kind of problem. And when we do perturbation theory, typically, the perturbation series comes closer and closer and closer and closer to the answer in a kind of uniform way. It's oscillating about the answer, getting closer and closer and closer. And we are looking for non-rigorous ways of extracting the information with tremendous efficiency. But I don't, under any condition, claim that this is the only way to extract the information. And Tomorrow, I'm going to show you another way to extract the information. But there's another thing that I have to show you tomorrow, which I promise you, you're going to love. This was a way to accelerate the convergence of a series that was already converging. But how do we accelerate the convergence of a series that is diverging? Okay, and I'm going to show you how to do that, too. Okay. So in other words, I claim that even if the series is diverging, the answer is buried there in the series. The answer is there. It's already there. Hard to believe, but it's already there. Okay, and we have to develop techniques that are indirect ways of extracting the information from the series. Yeah? I guess that would be uh, useful for understanding common field theories and why? Absolutely. So the point is that when you solve a quantum field theory, the only really the only analytical tool we have is to develop a series. In this case it's a series of Feynman diagrams. Okay. And um, you know first and, and they're organized by the number of vertices in the diagram. So we sum up all the diagrams with one vertex, then all the diagrams in a five to the four theory. Right. For example, if we're summing up the G phi to the fourth theory, all the diagrams with one vertex is only one of them. It looks like an infinity. Okay. Then, so this is first order in perturbation theory. Then we write down all the diagrams with two vertices, and there are two of them. Okay. This is a four-legged spider doing push-ups on a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey Mouse hat. Okay, and then all the diagrams with three vertices. So there's one that looks like this, and another that looks like this. Okay, and then there, there are all together. There are four diagrams. There's another one that looks like this, and then there's another one that looks like this. That's a re-entry vehicle, okay? and, and so on. And, and then in fourth order, there are 10 graphs. And in next order, there are about 29 graphs. Nobody knows a formula, by the way, for the number of graphs. There's no known formula for the number of graphs. But it's a very interesting question in combinatorics. Um, and, <clears throat> and when you add up these amplitudes, okay, this is the first term of the series, you know, I'll call it A1, here's A2, here's A3, here's A4, and so on. Um, that is a divergent series. And we have to know how to sum that series. If you don't know how to sum the series, what's the, per what's the point of learning Feynman diagrams? It's a divergent series. Doesn't, you know, if you think that a divergent series doesn't mean anything, then what's the point of doing that? What do you mean yes. by sum a divergent series? Kind of we have to define that. We, have to, we have to define what it, what it means to even use the word sum. Okay. So tomorrow I'm going to begin to explain to you. This is just the 
this is just the beginning, okay? And I have to explain to you summation theory. By the way, as you might have guessed, summation theory is partially rigorous, but mostly not rigorous. Okay? So it's very powerful, and it works in places where people cannot even justify why it's working. Okay, so we don't, I mean, this is, this is, I'm teaching you, um, um, you know, cutting edge mathematical physics, very useful mathematical physics, and it isn't even known in cases, in some cases, why it's working. This has worked for you. If you're interested, go to work. Okay, yes? How do you know when you use these methods and you get an answer? That is, that is right. Yeah. Exactly. It's a very, very good question. And the answer is asymptotics in general is self referential. If the numbers appear to be approaching a limit, then it looks like that must be the right answer. Okay? But typically, we don't know the right answer. So we just have to hope that it's, you know, if you're using the wrong technique, then typically these numbers are bouncing around and they don't converge to a limit. They don't, they just don't, they're, they're bouncing around. And we know that the Shanks model that we used over here, the model of the Shanks that we used, is not a good model for the behavior of the series. It wouldn't be if the series, for example, doesn't have a, an oscillating partial sum. Next time, I'm going to, I'll start out by showing you a series that does not have an oscillating partial sum. And therefore, Shanks is probably not going to be a good idea. So we use Richardson. You may not know it, but you have used Richardson 